So hi everyone. So welcome to this year's Peak Electricity Demand Response Webinar. So in past years, MAPC, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, uh, has primarily focused on our peak electricity demand notification program. So this year, we're expanding beyond MAPC's program by featuring National Grid and Eversources to speak about their new opportunities in demand response. So for today's agenda, oh, just not clicking through. Oh, there we go. So for today's agenda, we're um, briefly going to do introductions and then carry on towards background and concepts of peak demand and then go into MAPC's peak demand notification program before going into National Grid and Eversource's offerings. And then lastly, we have Newburyport and Melrose on the call today to talk about their experiences in the MAPC and National Grid programs. Or before doing so, um, so before we get started, I wanted to introduce myself and our guest speakers. So my name is Sabrina Peterson. I'm the Clean Energy Intern here at MAPC, and I'm joined here with my colleague, Patrick, Patrick Roach, who is the Energy Strategist at MAPC. From the utilities, we have Paul Wastank, who's the Demand Response Program Manager from National Grid. And we have Roshan Bakta, who's the implementation supervisor of their demand response projects at Eversource. And then lastly, from our municipalities, we have Martha Grover, who's the energy manager at Melrose, and Molly Ettenborough, who's the recycling and energy manager in Newburyport. So feel free to type questions in the Q&A box. It should be visible here in your WebEx um, on your side. Um, there is a chat box, but only put your questions and answers in that box. Um, so at the end, we hope that we can have some time for a Q&A discussion. So let's carry on towards background on capacity charges and peak demand. So we need to make sure that we have enough generation capacity in our region to meet demand at any given moment. The grid operator, ISO New England, developed a system that helps ensure sufficient generation by paying generators to promise and then deliver a certain generation capacity. So as shown on the left, a quarter of our electricity use comes in at just 6% of total hours each year. So this means that we're paying to have generation in place that's used just for a small fraction of the time. And that time is often during the hottest days of the summer when AC use skyrockets dramatically. So as shown on the right, we also have lots of generation coming offline in the next few years. So reducing demand can help ensure that we don't have grid instability. And then finally, we should also note the environmental impact of reducing our demand. So during times of high or peak demand, our dirtier fuel sources like oil and inefficient natural gas, they come online. So reducing demand during grid-wide peaks displaces comparatively more emissions than at other times by reducing the use of these high-emitting facilities. And thank you um, to Eversource for the slide. <laughs> So where does the money come from for ISO New England to pay the generator for capacity? So on your electricity bill, there are two parts. There's delivery and supply. Delivery refers to getting electricity to you by National Grid or Eversource, and supply refers to the actual electricity. The money for that payment is collected as part of the supply portion of your bill, which is known as the capacity charge. And ISO New England then passes that on to the generators. So the next question is, how does ISO New England determine how much to charge each customer for? The capacity charge is determined by this formula, and the price is set by ISO New England in an auction each year. And the quantity is the kilowatt your facility uses during that single one hour of the year that the grid is experiencing maximum or peak demand, and hence the term peak demand. The quantity is also referred to as an ICAP tag. So in the past, the price differed based on where in Massachusetts you were located. So in 2018, prices are mostly similar and they will be uniform starting in 2019. And although the price is really not under your control, the quantity is. 
So here's what the financial impact of the capacity charge might be on your bill. So $9.55 is this year's price for kilowatts. And it is uh, plausible that between your largest accounts, you have 1,000 kilowatts of demand. And that's roughly about $115,000 per year. So if you can reduce that quantity, you could pocket that the, the savings. So just a quick word about seeing the savings. So it depends on how your current supply co uh, contract is structured. So if you have a fixed rate contract, the supplier um, has estimated how much capacity they think you'll use, and they've built into the rate. And they might also pass through the cost of the capacity. And in that case, there'd be a fixed rate plus an adder for capacity. In a fixed rate option, you won't see immediate savings but rather you will likely be in a position to get a better rate the next time you contract for supply. So in a pass-through option, you'll see those savings directly on the supply bill. So feel free to contact us at, here at MAPC, and we can help you understand a little bit more about what type of contract you currently have. So you only have control over the ICAP tag in buildings with time of use meters. And these meters are necessary in order to tell when you are using energy. And these tend to be the largest municipal buildings, such as those listed here, such as like high school, um, middle school, wastewater treatments seems to be overlooked some bit. So you can look at the bills to see the applicable rate or account type, such as those listed here for National Grid and Eversource. And we do recommend that you reach out to your supplier or you can reach out to your national grid or your Eversource area manager, and they can confirm other applicable buildings that are in your city or town. So here's a calendar of ISO New England. And the way that ISO New England's calendar works is from June 1st to May 31st. And that means that, this, that usage this summer it determines the ICAP tag starting next June 1st. So for example, usage during the peak of summer 2017, it determines the ICAP tag starting this June 2018. So at this point, there's really nothing that you can do about the ICAP tag that was set last year. But this webinar today is supposed to prepare you to do well at reducing the ICAP tag this summer so you can reduce your capacity tag that will start on May 31st, 2019. And you can also check out ISO New England's calendar and pricing um, in the link below for um, the next three years out. So this goal is to really reduce your usage during the system-wide peak on the grid, which would look something like what is shown here. So this grid represents your typical building's energy usage throughout the year. And basically, you want to reduce Q, which is known as quantity, or ICAP tag, from the black line, which is your regular usage, to the green line, which is your reduced usage, during that single peak hour on the grid. So how can you achieve this reduction? So first, you can try to anticipate when the peak will occur and proactively reduce your demand with behavior modification. And this is the goal of MEPC's peak demand notification program. And there are other ways to reduce, such as installing efficient equipment, battery storage, and advanced controls. And later, we're going to hear a lot more from Eversource and National Grid. So stacking the benefits. And um, thank you so much, National Grid, for providing this slide as well. So when MAPC started out pr uh, our program back in, like, 2015, we were focused only on the red bar of avoiding capacity costs. And this was a really great way to introduce many of our municipalities to the idea of managing peak demand and saving money and emissions. And now National Grid and Eversource have launched programs that will also pay you for reducing demand, which is the blue bar. So as a side benefit, you will likely also get the red bar of avoided capacity costs through their programs too. And by participating in their programs, you can connect with providers that will help you participate in the ISO New England program that can provide additional payments for reducing demand, which is shown in the green bar. So as a result, it's possible that you can stack the benefits and you can earn as much as $200 per kilowatt. 
And today's webinar, we're mostly focusing on the red and the blue bars. So as mentioned, we're participating in the blue bar with the utilities, and you'll be, or even required to participate in the green bar sometimes. And if you are a municipality that's kind of new to demand management, uh, we'd like to maybe see MEPC, MEPC's program as like an entry, um, like a very easy entry point into the world of demand management. So if you're a municipality that has participated in MAPC's program before, we highly recommend that you look into to enroll your utilities program as next step and maybe even into ISO New England. So launched in 2015, MAPC's program has over 40 municipalities participating. And as mentioned, the goal of our program is to avoid capacity costs. And we think it's a really great entry point for those who really don't have much experience in demand response. So each day, MAPC assesses ISO New England's estimate data and assigns a risk level to it, and based on how likely we think that day could be the system-wide peak for the year. And the ratings are as follows. So there's likely, possible, and unlikely. And if likely, we highly suggest that your municipality uh, reduce demand during the predicted peak hour. And generally, we suggest reducing demand for an hour you know, on either side as well, in case the exact moment of the shift, um, the peak shifts. And it's, it is quite possible that that can shift. And you'll get an email that looks like this each morning by 10.15 a.m. And it looks out by a full week, so you can well prepare in advance to reduce demand. Um, and if it's likely, we'll tell you what hour to expect, and generally, it's late afternoon. So here's an example from Lynn. Lynn has been in MAPC's program since 2015, when it started. Um, so how do you actually act on our notifications and reduce demand? Um, so we have found that it's kind of critical that you really plan ahead of the summer. So first, you need to identify the champion um, and then begin educating the stakeholders to really get, um, you know, okay with the program. Um, and that includes really the administrators or other higher-ups as well as the other people that are on the ground. And it could be custodians as well and those who will actually implement some of the energy reduction measures. So once you have buy-in, then you need to really develop your action plan. And some of the typical actions that you can see are HVAC related, which could be usually raising the AC set point. Um, it could also be manually turning off lights and then also turning off other non-essential equipment. For example, um, for wastewater, that could mean running fewer uh, pumps temporarily. So depending on your building control system, some of these changes may have to be very manual and others could be centrally controlled. So for theory, for practice, um, you want to really make sure that everyone understands who will make the decision about whether and when to reduce. And as feedback goes, um, you really need to thank your participants after an event and follow up to identify, you know, what went wrong, what went right, and how you can improve in the future. And really across many of our municipalities, it is not uncommon to see them reduce their ICAP tags by like 50%. So if you prefer tracking real-time data yourself, you're more than welcome to visit ISO New England's website right here. And then also, ISO New England, they have a free app called iso to go um, and you can track the current system right on your phone too. And then, um, yeah. Great, hey, uh, this is Patrick from MAPC. I just wanna say thanks, Sabrina. Um, I think that was great. And I just wanna note, I think a lot of people on the phone today are experienced with capacity, and so a lot of that wasn't necessarily new. But if you are new, um, I just really wanna stress, as Sabrina mentioned, that your capacity tag is set during that one hour of the summer, and so by doing a little planning now and implementing a process um, 
that you probably only have to do, I think four to six times a summer is really what we estimate for how often we'll call a likely day. Um, and even on those likely days, it's only really a couple hours that you would be reducing your demand for. You can have a big impact. So if this is your first time sort of getting into this, we'd really encourage you to, to try this out and that it is something that's, that's pretty approachable. And so lastly, before we pass it off to National Grid, um, so the utilities now, they offer programs to pay you for doing the same demand reduction actions that we were just talking about. So this allows you to stack the benefits, you know, of avoiding capacity costs and getting a payment from the utility programs. So there's also an opportunity to get a payment from, I, from an ISO New England program too. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Paul Wasink, who's the Demand Response Program Manager of National Grid. Great. Thanks, Sabrina. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you everybody for coming today. So National Grid just started this program uh, last summer. This will be uh, the second summer of the program. And we kind of take a, a take at it. So um, MAPC is doing a great job on helping their customers to reduce their capacity costs, um, which is awesome. National Grid is really hoping to reduce the size of our system, of our transmission and distribution system. Well, luckily, these two goals are coincident. Uh, the National Grid system and the larger wholesale system peak at the same time. So you really kind of almost feel like you're double dipping here. So National Grid, um, in order to get this benefit, decided, looked at how customers were managing their capacity costs, how they were trying to control their energies at the peak hour, and we met, looked at, used our experience from our other energy efficiency programs and thought, how can we make this easier for customers? Well, one, it's very hard to forecast when that peak hour will be. And MAPC has done a great job on giving likelihoods. Um, uh, how likely is it that today will be a peak day? National Grid wanted to make, wanted to make it even easier and said, instead of telling you how likely it is, we're going to tell you when to curtail it on. Uh, we've done all the homework, spent tens of thousands of dollars on analytics work, and we can, we're going to call you, um, if you sign up, three to five times a summer. Whether we're right or not, whether that day is the peak or not, we're still going to pay you. Every time you curtail for us, it's going to affect your average curtailment value, and we're going to pay you based on that average. So even if we're wrong, um, and of course, there's only one year, so you know, two to um, four times a year, we're going to be wrong. You you don't have to ever feel like you're you're not getting something for curtailing. So what does that look like? Um, so the National Grid Program is a pay for performance model. You curtail, we pay. The incentive is thirty-five dollars per kilowatt every single year. Um, so every you you participate. You get another incentive every year. The incentives come out in October. Another um, key thing that National Grid brought to this program is we have vendors to help you. It's hard for customers to know themselves what pieces of equipment in their facilities or which facilities in their facility portfolio can curtail the most. So we did the, the homework for you guys. We did a, a large procurement process and found the the best three vendors in the Northeast to guide you guys through this. They are C-Power, Internoc, and IP Keys. All three of them are great companies. You can't go wrong with either, any of them. We wanted to, you know, have a small list so it's manageable, but have a list so it's also competitive. By the way, not pushing one vendor above another, but C-Power does hold a DCAM contract, which allows municipalities to contract with them through pre-negotiated rates without an RFP process. Here we go. So what does an event look like? We always give notifications a day ahead at 1 p.m. So you have time to plan for the next day. So for example, today is uh, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday. Um, so we would let you know by 2 o'clock today if there's going to be an event on, tomorrow on Wednesday. We only 
only call events in the summer, that's June, July, August, and September. June, July, and August are much more likely than September. Only on weekdays, never on holidays, and our events are always the same time frame, always from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Like I said, we will call events between three and seven uh, times a year. This graph here shows how we measure your um, performance. So that blue line there is the customer's baseline. That's set by the historical use of the customer. And that red line is what a customer is actually using during the demand response day. You can see that red line is much more up and down than the baseline because the baseline is taking in a lot of days. The red line is just that event day. You can see this customer got to the event start period um, right around 2 p.m. and they, they decreased their energy use. And they'll get paid for as much as they can curtail. Now those customers did a great job. They almost went down to zero. If they had curtailed more, we would pay more. And if they had curtailed less, we would pay less. And if something terrible happened and the customer just couldn't curtail that day at all, there are no penalties in the National Grid Program. You cannot lose money through participating in our program. Here's a flyer, and we'll be sending out this out separately. This uh, is just a really quick two-page flyer that gives you all the highlights of the program, how you get paid, what vendors are participating, um, just everything you really need to know. We'll be setting, sending this out separately as uh, an attachment, um, including the slides of this uh, presentation. Okay, um, in closing, before I, I hand it off to Roshan, um, the ICAP hour and the National Grid hour are coincidence, so it almost feels like double dipping. And as Sabrina mentioned, there's even a third potential benefit out there, participating through the vendor and ISO markets. Um, so like Sabrina said, if you stack all these benefits, I mean, just the ICAP hour is a big benefit, but if you stack all three of these benefits, it becomes very compelling. It's something you should look into. Thanks. And Paul, this is Patrick. Would you mind just going back one slide and just talking briefly about that um, final bucket of the ISO offering? Um, yep. Let me. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> so the ISO offering. So. Um, like Sabrina covered very well, there's the ICAP hour, which is the peak hour of the year, and there's the National Grid Program. Those two happen at the same time. This third uh, program is offered by the ISO, or the, um, the market aggregator, and that's actually an emergency demand response program. So this happens at different times. This typically happens when there's a forced outage of a major power plant. This doesn't usually happen when the, the grid is at peak. So if you sign up for this third program, you can make a lot of money, but you're, you're signing up for more events. Now, historically, there's from zero to two ISO events, or emergency demand response events a year. Last year, we didn't have any. So you actually get paid for nothing. Um, but you know, one year, there's gonna be two events. So if you stack all these programs together, you're really signing up for like five, up to nine events per year. Um, some years much less than others. And your, the vendors um, on the flyer can walk you through all this. They are um, certified market participants and they can get you into the markets so that you can monetize this. Great, thanks help, so much. And Paul, I think, yeah, could you just also talk about um, I think how in your program there's no additional uh, uh, technology required to be installed, whereas with the ISO program I think there is. Oh, absolutely. Um, so one good thing about, about being a utility is we already have a meter on everybody's facility, at least the large ones. Um, so there is no additional metering requirements to participate in the National Grid program. If you do want to participate in the ISO program through your vendor, there, there is additional metering. Unfortunately, the utility meter can't send the information to the ISO fast enough. So there's a third party meter involved. However, um, the, 
the vendors always organize these so there's no upfront cost. Even if there is metering cost, they're just going to take that out of your annual savings that you get from participating in these programs. So all three of the vendors that National Grid is working with always position this so that the customer never has to pay them a dime. Um, even if there's metering cost, it'll just come out of their incentives. Great, thanks so much. And uh, now we will pass control over to you, Roshan. Okay. Um, I think I have control. Okay. So thanks, Paul. Uh, my name is Roshan Bach. I'm the supervisor here in energy efficiency over at Eversource. Um, just a little background on the way that these uh, utility programs are being crafted um, and being thought of. Uh, it's in a three-year cycle, so I think every, everyone may be familiar with um, our general energy efficiency programs. Um, we write them in three-year blocks um, and release them. And so this year, 2018, is the last year of a program cycle. Um, so we are currently writing a plan, uh, Eversource, National Grid, and all the other program administrators, administrators across the state are writing a plan for the next three-year cycle, which would be years 19, 20, and 21. So for those years, um, our programs are going to look basically the same. Um, we're, we're, we're putting in the same outline uh, statewide. So regardless of where you are in the state or who your utility provider is, um, you're going to have a path to participate in the demand program, and it's likely going to look the same across the entire state. Um, this year, so what Paul just presented and what I'm about to present, um, these aren't programs yet. Uh, we're calling them demonstrations. So National Grid um, and Paul have been running their Connected Solutions um, demonstration for, I think this is the second year. Um, this will be Eversource's first year of running our demonstration program. Um, and really what we're trying to do with these demonstrations is um, gain some insight into the market and how to run the program before we wrote it into our three-year plan cycle. So uh, National Grid is testing their connected solutions platform. Um, Eversource, we took a, a little bit different of approach where we wanted to test um, a bunch of different types of technology, and only one of those technologies is this traditional demand response, um, large commercial type approach. So for that approach, we did we selected Enernoc as well um, to run this. Uh, it's, it's very similar to what Paul outlined. We'd be calling events through Enernoc. Um, the customer would get their payments through Enernoc, um, and this is in addition to any SCM um, calls that would be made to that customer. Uh, one thing that we're also going to test uh, with Enernoc is winter demand response. So there's, there's, there's a push sort of statewide for winter gas uh, reliability. So we're testing that this year as well um, before we write anything into our plan. Um, just another slide on Enernoc applicability. I think Paul um, and Patrick, you, you guys had covered it, um, applicable for, for the municipalities, your large buildings, um, really. So for, for our small commercial uh, demonstration, it's more of a thermostat-based approach, um, and maybe there's some buildings that are owned by the municipality that fall into small commercial and look more like a small commercial customer. Um, our idea, what we wanted to test with those smaller type customers, um, is not so much a curtailment type program, but using a smart thermostat, the Wi-Fi enabled thermostat, um, and letting the set point on those hot summer days float up four degrees for those few hours that are really important to us, um, and that reduces that customer's demand. So we're doing the same sort of thing that Paul mentioned. Um, we're kind of, we've, we've spent a lot of money um, in doing analytics. We have a lot of smart uh, partners on board, just like National Grid. Um, in a lot of cases, we're using the same exact partners um, to do this, these predictive um, analyses for us. So 
we're aiming to make just a few calls over the summer and to be able to hit that one particular hour um, through these, this analysis that our vendors are doing for us. So that's the small commercial, like I said, uh, Wi-Fi thermostat-based approach. Um, so we have a lot of other, those are two technologies that, that we're testing. Like I said, we're testing out seven um, technologies, and I'm just going to quickly uh, run through the other ones because I know there are some um, other customers that want to present on their stories um, for us. So let me just quickly go through this. Uh, yeah, so I think this is the only slide I'll present on. So I talked about the bottom two there, um, number six and seven, that we're testing within the demand response uh, type category. Um, we're also testing a few different other types of technologies that aren't just a traditional demand response. So we're testing a few different battery storage um, options. The first battery storage would be a daily type dispatch where we're charging the battery overnight and discharging it during those peak hours of, of the day um, every day. So the good thing about that is you're definitely going to hit your ICAP tag because um, you're discharging it every day um, for those uh, particular hours. Um, the downside is you're going to affect your baseline. So I think it was Paul that was mentioning the way the baselines are calculated. Um, if you're running this every day, that now becomes your baseline. So we're testing out whether that uh, model is more effective than the other model. Um, which is more of a target dis dispatch, so charging that battery and only letting it, it run for some short periods of time, um, really targeted those few hours um, during the summer that make the most sense. So again, doing those analytics, figuring out this is the best time of the summer for me to dispatch this battery. Um, and both of those things, both of those vendors would be installing a battery system um, behind the customer's meter. The customer would, um, it would be on their site, you need space for that, though. You need a, probably, I would say, um, a tractor trailer or something like that that can park out in a parking lot um, or close to close to your building. Um, thermal energy storage is something that we're testing as well. Now, the AC ice storage, that's probably the most applicable for municipalities. Um, this would be for your rooftop units, so um, 10 to 20 ton size rooftop units. Uh, what we're testing there is this modular ice box system, um, which makes ice overnight and then melts it during the day. So really a lot like a, a electric battery storage. This is just thermal energy storage where we're, we're making something overnight, discharging it during the day. Um, you're, you're not running your compressors or anything during the daytime, so that saves you um, your demand charge. The phase change material is applicable really only for large freezers. We're partnering with a vendor who makes a product that can go into freezers. Um, it freezes overnight, and then it melts during the day. Same as the AC ice, but this time you're using that melting phase change material to keep your uh, food cold instead of your uh, space temperature cold. And then finally, the last one I haven't talked about um, is a software and controls approach to all of this where you're taking a software vendor, um, incorporating them into your building automation system, so whether that's Johnson Controls or Siemens or Schneider, whatever you have, um, they're going to take a look at your control system and then throughout the day monitor what's going on as far as fan speed, set points, et cetera, um, and write scripts to make sure that you don't go past a certain demand charge and, and really limit um, that on the way your building is operating. So, Patrick, I think, I mean, I, I don't want to jump into a bunch of detail on these. I'm going to flip through them. I think you wanted me to save some time at the end. So um, if you feel like that's enough detail on this, uh, again, if there's any anyone who's interested in participating, um, please feel to contact me, um, and I'd be happy to set you up with one of our uh, account reps to go over some of these options um, that make the most sense for your municipality. Yeah, that's great, Roshan. Thanks so much. I think uh, I would just ask you also to just address the upfront cost for municipalities um, in terms of, the, I think, the batteries versus the, the other two options. Yeah, so battery storage um, is the, the most 
uh, extensive one of those solutions that we're testing, um, probably to no, no surprise or shock to anyone. Um, so our demonstration, we're going to pay for, it's close to 70% of that installation, so really, really high amount. Um, the other 30%, uh, I think the customers are working with those vendors on 10-year terms to sort of pay that out, but, you know, Eversource is going to pay for 70% of that, of that project. Um, as far as all of the other ones, um, ice storage, uh, any of the thermostat, any of the other ones, Eversource is paying 100% for the rest of those. Yeah, thanks very much. I, so I think it's just important for people to um, remember what Roshan said in the beginning, that this is sort of a, at the pilot stage and it's unclear, you know, what will happen for the next three-year plan, uh, whether a similarly great deal will be available. So I think if some of those are interesting um, to really try to move forward to explore those, and I would just say that if procurement, um, if you do have any procurement challenges, you know, given that we're talking to municipalities, uh, MAPC would be happy to help you think through that as well. Um, so thanks very much, Roshan. I think that's great. So we'll turn it over to Molly from Newburyport. Hi, it's um, Molly at Borough City of Newburyport. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, so we've been participating with the MAPC um, demand notification program for the past couple of years and we are utilizing it for six buildings in the city of Newburyport, four schools and our wastewater treatment facility and our water treatment facility. Um, so when we get these notifications, um, I make sure that the building operators of those um, buildings are receiving them um, and that they know that in, during the coming week they can start shedding load, whether that be AC, lighting, or pumps, whatever the case may be. Um, they might even um, program things at the school, for instance, differently if they know an event might be happening. They might move people that are in the building for summer courses into a different part of the building or they actually readjust how the building is going to be operating. Um, so that has been extremely helpful to us. Um, I think all of the buildings um, and all the managers are, um, are enjoying this program, liking this program, and. Um, we are uh, very happy to be working with MAPC and, and grateful that we are able to do this with them. Um, uh, National Grid, I didn't realize, um, was offering this until recently, so we will definitely be signing up with them as well. And um, I'm excited to hear that the utilities are offering are starting to think about all these different technologies. Um, we've been talking about a lot of these different ideas um, at our energy advisory committee level here in town, so it's um, nice to hear that some of these things might be happening. But I would um, highly recommend it for anybody that's not doing it. And thanks so much, Molly. Would you mind just talking a little bit more about when you first got involved, the process to kind of get stakeholders on board and develop your plan and, and how that, that process went, any recommendations you might have for others starting out? Sure. So, yeah, so um, it really started with me, and I, I don't remember exactly, but it, I probably, um, I usually attend the uh, Mass Municipal Association meeting that's held in January um, in Boston, and I probably had a conversation with Patrick or someone um, at that conference or somehow, um, you know, heard about the MAPC program and um, became aware of it then and returned to the city um, spoke to all of the, um, you know, facilities managers that um, would have, um, would be able to utilize this, um, you know, looking at our um, our meters and seeing which ones it made sense for, um, and reviewed the program with them, got them interested through, um, you know, myself educating or through the MAPC um, webinars um, to get them interested in that. And then um, I believe they all, are also signed up, but just in case, I also get the notifications and I send it to them as well. So we sort of make sure that everybody's getting the notifications um, when we get them. So they, they have ample time to plan for these different events. Awesome, that's great. And great to hear that you've got it across schools and uh, wastewater and, and water treatment. Um, yep. I think what you yeah, highlighted great. about possibly sometimes moving, you know, changing the way 
uh, events are actually scheduled at the building um, is a great one and one that if you give enough foresight uh, allows people the time to do that. So that's really great to hear. Right. Excellent. Well then, I think we could uh, move on to Martha and then we'll have t plenty of time at the end for questions to dig deeper into um, all this stuff. Hi, it's Martha Grover from the city of Melrose. Um, so we participated with in the MAPC program I, from the start and um, uh, I think we realized a savings of around forty or fifty thousand dollars just in the first year, uh, which was a great way to keep um, our public works facility staff interested in in learning more and figuring out more ways to do this. And um, I happened to hear about Paul Wasink. We're, we're a National Grid customer, both um, Gas and Electric, and Paul. Paul's our spouses work together, so we see each other at holiday, the annual holiday event, and he was sharing with me this Connected Solutions program, so um, I pursued it, and we, we enrolled in it um, last year. And as I, what we, I talked to all of the, the three vendors and um, to figure out their different program offerings and chose C-Power, and the stacking effect or impact of this I think is um, is really great because you start out with the MAPC program and you that's a great way to, to ease into this and then um, with the CPAR program and we even signed up for the ISO NE program through through um, CPOWER um, you're getting paid to do to do things that you were that we were already doing, so it's just more ways to bring in some revenue um, for shedding load on on those particular days. Uh, and so far, it's it's gone pretty well. We have the benefit that um, in Melrose, um, the, our G3 accounts or the, the buildings that are enrolled in this are the high school and middle school, and all of our Buildings are managed by one person through our building management system. So it's she can um, control and operate these buildings remotely from her phone um, very easily. So it, it, ha it wasn't a huge lift to uh, implement these programs here because we it, it was just pretty much um, me and Anne, our um, assistant DPW director. Uh, who decided she was game to try this. And um, I would say that after the first year, um, my impression is that being in the MAPC program and then Connected Solutions and then the ISO program, it's a lot of notifications, um, a lot of emails and texts and phone calls. So hopefully that will we'll figure that out a little bit better this summer and figure out how to cut down on some of that or combine them more you know, figure it out. Are there any other questions? No, I think that that was a great overview and good to hear about the the, pro, the program um, that you've you know, worked with both C-Power and uh, ISO NE. Um, yeah, I guess, I don't know if there's any process. Do you guys do any uh, sort of follow-up after events to see how they went and if they could go better? It sounds like it's it's a pretty straightforward process with the, with the centralized control, but um, right. or do you do any right. any reporting at the end of the year about, about the impact or I don't know? Well, we get that reporting from the vendor, from C-Power. Um, with the ISO and E program, as I think Paul mentioned, it, it there are meters that are installed, and those are five-minute meters. Those didn't those didn't get installed until I think sometime last fall. It was it took a while to get in the queue. Um, so we now have access to not just 15-minute interval data, but five-minute data. That um, I think we'll probably be looking at that more closely. And the nice thing is that while you're in a for, for those accounts while you're in an it, while you're in an event we can now see in real time what we're doing and how it's impacting the usage in that building so yeah, if, I think that's if, a great we, if we're not point. dropping enough 
and we'll just, you know, go after another piece of equipment. Yeah, that's a great point. I think visibility into what your building is doing is something that uh, a lot of facilities managers wish they had more of. And mm -hmm. having that having that uh, meter installed as well as the software you get when you are participating in the that sort of third bucket of the ISO New England program, um, yeah, that's a really nice benefit yeah. of that. Although sure. it's not free. You do pay for the meter, and it's deducted from, from the incentive. Mm -hmm. But would you second what... Uh, yeah, Paul mentioned that it's it's still net positive. You're not yes, it was incurring correct. the cost. Yep, okay. it was net positive. Great, great. So I think with that we could move on to general questions. Um, we get some of our contact information there. We will circulate these slides along with the recording of the webinar, and uh, everyone's contact information is either on this slide or the two slides before. Um, we just got the graphic there again of sort of the different benefits you can stack, and I think we'd certainly encourage everybody, uh, it's May 1st, the MAPC's program and I believe the utilities as well are going to be starting in June, beginning of June, so uh, the peaks um, don't always happen in June, but they can and they did last year. So I think this next month is really a good time to start getting your strategy together, especially if you are interested in um, getting involved, you know, signed up for either the utility programs or even um, taking advantage of some of those uh, other types of offerings that Eversource has on the software or the, um, or the thermal storage to really get in touch. So we have had uh, just a well, it looks like just one question come in right now, but feel free for others to send those in on the chat box, or sorry, not the chat box, the Q&A box. Um, so, yeah, it sounds like uh, from, from Newton, and we can connect uh, um, uh, Bill Ferguson to, to Roshan afterwards, but it sounds like Newton's uh, quite interested in a bunch of the different offerings you have. So um, we'll connect you guys, and uh, if MAPC needs to help out, out at all with procurement, you know, just, just let us know. Uh, so actually that was more of a statement than a question that came in. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, any other questions uh, for folks out there or um, – other panelists, things you felt that weren't clear that you'd like a chance to uh, elaborate on? Yeah, this is Roshan. I'll just address that one, too. Um, so I'm happy to chat with Bill Ferguson or William Ferguson. Um, I think we're already engaged with the city of Newton um, as well on this demonstration. I know my team has had, has been speaking with them, so um, just give, give me a ring or shoot me an email and make sure that uh, no wires are getting crossed because I'm, I'm pretty sure that Newton's already working in one of these demonstrations with one of these demonstration vendors already. Oh, right. Well, hey, that's very encouraging news. Uh, so we have another question that came in that said, how is curtailment calculated uh, for the peak hour versus the seven-day average? Uh, so I think that might be more of a question to either to both Roshan and maybe um, and Paul about just how in your programs you actually calculate that reduction. Yeah, yeah. I can take that one first. This is Paul. Um, so for the peak hour, for the for the red one there, the capacity cost, you actually are charged eighty five dollars per kilowatt year for every kilowatt you're consuming during the peak hour. So they don't really need to do a baseline. You're just you're paying for every single one. For the National Grid program, we look back at the last 10 similar days, so the last 10 weekdays or about two weeks um, to develop your baseline. So it's really just an average. Um, for example, for the baseline at 2 p.m., it's the average of what energy you are using for the last 10 days at 2 p.m. versus what you're using on the event day at 2 p.m. In the industry, they refer to this as the last 10 of 10 baseline methodology. Um, it's actually the exact same methodology that ISO New England uses for that green program at the bottom, for their emergency demand response program and the forward capacity market. One thing yeah. Martha said um, that I think is, is worth repeating, it takes a while if you're going to participate in the ISO program to get your meter installed. So if you guys are interested in getting into all three programs, 
you really want to jump on this now. Um, and even the National Grid Program closes at the end of this month, May 31st. So we're really up to the wire here. Um, summer will be here before we know it. So get in as soon as you can if you're in National Grid Electric Territory. So Eversource is the, is the same way. We use that same, I think that's, that's the industry standard as Paul described it. Um, you just do a, a average of the last 10 weekdays um, for, to build your baseline. And the one thing I would add is, is you throw away any days that an event might have been called. So say four days ago, ISO called an event, we would throw that day away when calculating your baseline. Great. And this is Patrick. The only thing I'd add, too, is if you're if we're talking about just sort of the avoided capacity cost, um, as Paul mentioned, it's you just get billed for, you know, whatever demand you have during that hour. If you are interested in sort of what your baseline is or what, you know, essentially what you got charged for last year, you can uh, contact either your supplier or make a request through the utility for um, your cap tag. Uh, or you can even get uh, an Excel spreadsheet of the, your demand um, for the for a, a certain period of time um, or for the whole summer if you want to look into it. But your supplier uh, should be able to help you find out what your cap tag was last year. Yeah, um, I have a question for Molly and for Martha, which is for your supply contracts, have you decided to do a fixed rate uh, where the capacity cost is sort of already baked in, uh, or do you have a pass-through uh, for the capacity? Um, Newburyport has a fixed rate contract. Okay, great. Yeah, and we did, we did that just because we didn't want the um, uncertainty. Great. Um, Melrose had a pass through, which is how I was, we were able to avoid um, through the um, we were able to avoid capacity costs in 2015 and 16, um, and then we switched to a fixed rate contract only because um, the capacity cost that they were that the suppliers were bidding on that summer were artificially low because our high school had, was under construction. So it made sense uh, at that point. Our, our, our cap tags are never going to be that low ever again. Right. Uh, so I see. Okay. We, we capitalized on, on that opportunity. But um, I, I think in a future contract, we might, we might do capacity as a pass-through. Okay. Great. That's great. And um, I think that uh, Acton Boxborough is another – uh, their school district has been a participant in our program for a while. I believe they've stuck with a pass-through contract because they found success in managing uh, their demand. <clears throat> so that's all great to hear. Uh, and I would just also kind of like to stress for everybody, we are talking a lot about dollar signs, which is really important. But uh, as Sabrina mentioned in the very beginning, there's definitely an emissions impact here to avoiding some of the, the dirtiest uh, fuel. And what Roshan said about the winter peak, I think, is also interesting, and hopefully there'll be more to come on that. Um, many of you may know we burned a lot of, a lot of oil uh, during the what was it, bomb cyclone this winter. Um, so reducing the winter peak can be important too. Um, so there's certainly a climate angle here we don't want to forget. Right, right. And, and this is Martha, I'll say one other thing. Um, in terms of the, the slide about Lynn and involving participants or thanking participants, one of the things that we were able to do here in Melrose is, you know, uh, because it's the high school and middle school that are where we're taking all of this action and where we're, on the hottest days of the summer, we're shutting them down. Um, we used some of the funds from the C Power or from the Connected Solutions program to purchase a solar-powered phone charging bench for the for their campus, which I thought was a because that was that was money that we really weren't counting on in the fiscal year. It was just we we weren't sure what how it was going to go, and I thought that was a nice way to just show our appreciation for them sitting <laughs> in very yeah, in, you know, warm do. buildings. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So thank you so much to
to um, Paul, Roshan, Molly, Martha for making it for this webinar. And I hope that all of our participants learned a lot today, whether it be you're a beginner or you're looking forward to working with the utilities or checking out ISO New England's program. And um, we will have a recording of this webinar on our MAPC's YouTube account. Um, and you can share it among anyone in your offices too. And always feel free to reach out to Patrick or I, or you can reach out to any of our speakers. And um, in our follow-up email, we'll also include all this contact info and slides as well. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, have a good one. Thanks, Peter. Bye-bye.